Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thanks for being here as always. That is the interlull over, done and dusted. And if you are looking forward to an Arsenal packed weekend, well, you've got to wait a bit longer because we're not playing until Monday night. I should turn my phone off here. It makes noises. That'd be a mad thing to do, wouldn't it? Get all the various text message noises in the world and then just spread them at random throughout the podcast and people will be listening going, is that, was that my phone? I don't know. If, is that mine? I mean, I could do that, I suppose, but it's, it seems a bit uh, seems a bit childish. A childish thing to do, and you guys know me. That's not, that's not really who I am at all. So, nah, I think I'll give that kind of shit a bit of a miss, to be honest. Now, let's get on with today's show. A little bit later on, I will be talking to uh, Dan from HLTCO, which, of course, is the, uh, I guess, the most prominent Crystal Palace podcast. He operates on Patreon. He does five podcasts a week. No knows his onions when it comes to Crystal Palace, and we'll be talking to him about Palace, about Patrick Vieira, of course. He is the new manager there. In a couple of moments' time, I will be joined by the man from East Lower. We haven't spoken to him in quite a while, so he'll be on to shoot the Arsenal breeze, if you like. And after that, we are going to have a competition to give away. We've got a game. Not a video game, not a PlayStation game, or an Xbox game, or a Wii game, or a Sega Mega Drive game, or a a ZX Spectrum game, or whatever. It's a board game. You remember those? Well, this one is called Super Club, and it's got an Arsenal expansion. It's basically a football manager board game. I'll tell you a bit more about it later on, and we have three copies of that to give away. So stay tuned. Hopefully you had a a good, peaceful, and uneventful interlull. I know they're getting quite boring, these interlulls. They feel more boring than ever this time around. Like, they've always been more or less the same, haven't they? Two weeks without any football, but the last couple have felt pretty interminable. I don't know what it is, whether it's simply because we don't have any of that extra football going on, the European football that gives us a a saturation to the point where we need the interlull to an extent where we sort of down tools a little bit and catch our breath. We haven't had that. We haven't had that that overexposure to football, so maybe that's what it is, but it was a quite decent international break for some of our players. Emile Smith-Rowe, he scored for England under under 21s, a really good goal as well. Uh, Bakayo Saka scored for England. Nicolas Pepe scored for the Ivory Coast. Pierre Emerick Aubameyang scored for Gabon. And of course, Thomas Partey scored for uh, Ghana twice. Two games against Zimbabwe, two goals for Thomas Partey. And he must be coming back and thinking, can we play you every week? But you can't, unfortunately, play Zimbabwe in the Premier League. If only we could somehow hypnotize him into thinking he was playing Zimbabwe, maybe that's the solution to ending his Arsenal goal-scoring drought. It would be very nice to see him get off the mark uh, in red and white starting on Monday against Palace. But look, we'll chat about that and more with our guest right now. Delighted to welcome back to the show after quite a while. It is the man from East Lower. Hello there. Hello to you. I've forgotten, I've forgotten how this all works. We just sit here and talk oh, nonsense. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can figure it out. <laughs> like riding a bike. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that would be fine. I won't be falling off too much. No. Uh, eastlower.co.uk had a slight revival uh, in mm. recent times. It's not like the uh, output has been prolific or anything, but... You've uh, put a few things down on paper. How did it feel to get back on the old jogging or blogging uh, treadmill again? Yeah, it, it's it felt you know it felt good. It, it's it was one of those things that the the longer you don't do it for, the easier it becomes to to not do it. <laughs> uh, not that you would understand that concept at all, but um, but and then it just gets harder and harder, and then you know you kind of think, well, what would I say? Mm. But actually, you know, I I do I do really enjoy it, and my wife kicked me up the arse, which is. Uh, you know, a lovely thing to do. And, um, um, and so, yeah, it did feel good, but, um, certainly not doing it every morning, maybe once a week. That's what I'm trying to go back on, but it is, it's weird to think that like, well, a bit like you, I think you started, what was it? 2001 or two? Two. Yeah. I think I was 2003 and yeah, so it's a long time to completely give it up. So that was kind of partly gnawing at me as well. So, uh, 
it's nice um, to uh, be back, sort of. Sort of. Okay. Well, look, yeah. we'll we'll see what this season brings and what you might then produce in terms of blogging content. It's kind of easier to write stuff when when things are going well, or you know, nobody really needs to sit down unless there's an element of catharsis to it. You know, if you're doing it occasionally, you don't want to sit down and pour over the worst things. So hopefully, we can do lots of nice things on the pitch that will you know inspire you to write. Always the goal, isn't it, to 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 be able to kind of uh, enjoy what you're writing about, yeah. mind you, you know. I think a lot of people quite enjoy the uh, the misery as well. Well, that is true. That is true. Okay, so look, how have you found this season so far? It's, uh, you know, seven games in in terms of the Premier League. The second four were good. The first three weren't so good. Um, you know, where where have you found yourself in your Arsenal headspace with this? Well, if, if, if only there was a phrase that sort of described how football can, can uh, you know, can have two halves to it. I, maybe there is, I don't know. But so, so, Certainly, the season so far, I and mean, it was, you know, the, it was terrible to start with. <laughs> let's not let's not mess around. Yeah. But um, and of course, you know, social media being what it is, uh, everyone's calling for the boss's head, and everyone's saying it's a complete calamity. And you know, the truth is always somewhere in between once things settle down. And I think that's probably where we've ended up. So it was a terrible start, and we've picked things up a bit now, and we're now sort of, I don't know. I think we're. I think things are in a lot better place, and so uh, you know, fair play, fair play to Arteta and to the team. It seems to have been re- revitalised with, with, uh, for, with with some of the new players, but also you know the, the kind of Halen crowd. So I've I've enjoyed it. And, you know, to be honest, I enjoyed the Chelsea game, the first game. The atmosphere was just amazing, and uh, there was a real buzz about the place. And it's been the same every home game since. So it's not that I haven't enjoyed it, but the football's definitely been, um, you know. A game of two halves. Yeah, I mean, it was easy to enjoy the the occasion of the Chelsea game, if not the actual game itself, because it felt like, was that the first game when everyone was allowed back, the Chelsea game? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, it was. And it was full. And, and actually, there was well, there were a couple of games, weren't there, whenever it was, where about 3,000 people, I, I wasn't, I couldn't get tickets for those. So um, mm. it was the first time I'd been back in, you know, in a lot, in, in 18 months. So it did feel, it feel really, it did feel really good. Yeah, it did, and it still does. It's got the, the kind of nice routine to it, which everyone loves. is um, It's it's great. Yeah, I mean, th- I think we could all do with you know things that are uh, approaching normal at this point. I remember when we had some of those games, those like limited capacity games, and and you're thinking, wow, you know, two thousand people can actually make quite a bit of noise. This is like desperate trying to get anything that that feels normal. When in reality, it's like. Well, there's 58,000 people not there. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the 2,000 that are there. And fair play to them. They did make noise. But but that's, I think, how desperate we were during those lockdown periods. Too. No, it's exactly right. And and there's nothing, you know, there's so such a big percentage of, of, of the experience of football is the crowd that's there. It's, mm. it's such a fundamental part of it that actually, you know, we, we did pretty well, really, to get through all that time without any crowds and, and in a relatively normal way. But it's so much better now. Yeah, and um, so a long, long may it last. So look, you you mentioned the Halem boys. I'm going to ask you about them in a minute. But we also made six signings uh, yeah. during the summer uh, who've come into the team um, in various ways. I know it's early days, and you know you can nail your colours to a particular mast, and then that mast can snap off in the wind. But uh, of the of the six, who's caught your eye the most? Uh, well, I, I think it's probably you know I think we knew about Erdegaard already. So mm. I think there's no surprises there, although I think he's been good and a really high energy, which I love about him. Um, always looking for a forward pass and that kind of whole, that whole looking for a forward pass thing, same with Ben White, is something that we've lacked a bit. You know, there's been a bit too much sideways, sidewaysness. Mm. And um, so I've really enjoyed um, watching him. Um, but I, I guess... Um, I think, you know, you can't go far other than saying Ramsdale has is, is been the one that surprised me the most. It's probably the same for a lot of people because um, I didn't know much about him. I won't lie. And, um, you know, he got a little bit, some people were a bit sort of down on him for whatever reason. And um, so actually seeing him in the flesh and seeing the kind of energy he brings to the game was is, is really great. And he's an absolute master of PR at the moment. <laughs> and the guy, he really knows how, you know, he knows how to win a crowd over. And, um, and you know, obviously there'll be some trickier times, but the one or two mistakes he's made doesn't seem to have mattered so much because he's got a kind of a synergy with the crowd. Which so I've liked him, 
and, and Tommy Asu was again. I, I quite what I quite like is the fact that the complete unknown quantities to me. So um, uh, those two in particular, I think I, I've really enjoyed watching. Yeah, the freshness that they bring to the team is is really important. I think as well. There's a the, you know a sense of staleness with some of the players who've been in the squad for the last few years, and to have something fresh and different and new, and and to be able to at least pin some hope on their potential we 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 don't know yet if they're all going to realize that you know 21 22 23 is, a, is still really young and mm. a lot of players can come in look good and then hit the wall or you know whatever happens they don't quite uh, reach the levels that you want but for now for them to come in and, and to be able to we can sort of feel a bit aspirational about them you know what i mean yeah Absolutely, I think I think it brings a certain energy. They've all got something to prove in one way or another, which you need on a football mm. pitch. And um, and you know the strategy to me is completely right. Uh, we can't compete at the sort of seventy-five million pound end of the uh, spectrum, at least not regularly. So what you need to do is do it a different different way. And I think um, for all the criticism that the people running the club have received, you know, I think it's a sound way of doing it, um, and it's it's refreshing. So. Yeah, I think with that, with the com, com, you know, combined with um, party, I suppose he's, he's been really good, and he's relatively new still. Mm. But also, you know, the young guys coming through, which we we all love to see. So it does it does feel fresh. That's not to say it's perfect, but it definitely feels fresh and exciting. Thomas Party, there's a big onus on him now, isn't there, to come in and and really step up. Uh, we saw him score a couple of goals in midweek for for Ghana against Zimbabwe. Uh, You know, like buses, you hope that one or two or three might come along at once when it comes to goals. So it was nice to see that aspect of his game because, you know, some of his shooting has been, uh, what's a good word? I mean, wayward would be a nice way, a diplomatic way of putting it. It's an-esque, hasn't it? It really really has. Yeah. But Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, it's almost getting to the point now where you just, you see him with the ball and you think, yeah, that's going, that's going at about sort of 45 degrees and sure enough flies over the top. But um, I think he's getting closer. He had a good shot. Was it against Spurs? I think he did. And um, uh, so he's getting closer. But I don't think that's the most important part of his game. So um, uh, when it comes, it'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully soon, hopefully soon. But as the, the experienced man in midfield, you know, I think the, the plan, whether people agreed with it or not, uh, with regards Granite Jack, I think the plan was for those two guys to be like the the senior men in the heart of the team and for one of them to be gone look I know some people don't care for Granite Xhaka some people think he's important this is the 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 Granite Xhaka dichotomy whatever you want to call it it exists it's real but we don't have Granite Xhaka so there is now a bit more pressure on Partey to be that that senior guy um, and and to sort of maybe realize you know, we paid a big fee for him. I think we all expected maybe a little bit more than we've seen from him so far. I think there are some, you know, performances which haven't been great and he hasn't quite reached the level that we thought yet. So without Shaka, uh, th- there's a little bit more weight on his shoulders. Yeah, there is. And and that's fair. I think he cost 50 million quid um, and he's very experienced. He's played at the very, you know, at the top level for, mm. for the side. So um, I think that's only fair. And, and you know, uh, that's why he gets paid the mega bucks. I think, yeah, I, I do think he's had a couple of iffy games, but let's be honest, he's been in a team that has struggled for consistency. And, you know, I think there are very few players, to be honest, in, in football who can take a game by the scruff of the neck. They, they're pretty few and far between. And, and I think he suffers a bit when the team's suffering a bit. And I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with that. So um, a bit more consistency would be great from them all, but from him, certainly at, as his age and, uh, he's what is he? Twenty six and possibly old. He's old. No, I think he's twenty eight. So you oh, know, yeah. Oh, so the, yeah. So can we expect a bit time. more? <laughs> it's still, still young, but um, but certainly by comparison to sort of the the six guys that have come in, he's you know that, that those years make a big difference. So I don't think we can be too harsh on him when he has the odd four game because I think that's kind of a bit structural as well. No, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair point. Um, And we do sometimes maybe focus a little bit on individuals and what they can and can't do or aren't doing without looking at the overall structure of things and, you know, without wanting to delve too deeply into that. I think there there have been, um, even those people who are 100% behind Arteta will say, 
there have been some structural issues, some some overall issues with the team's performances that then impact on players and individuals. But, you know, this is his uh, group of players now, so uh, it'll be nice to see them click and hopefully start clicking soon. Talk to me about uh, Emil Smith-Rowe. Did you see the goal he scored in, in midweek? Do you know what? I haven't seen it. It's lovely. It's a very nice. Well, he's got a, a tremendous burst of pace, which I think is an interesting thing for an Arsenal player to have because we don't really have too many players. The goal was basically a counter attack. Andorra uh, had a corner. England got the ball. Smith Rowe broke from deep, burst ahead of everybody, stayed ahead of everybody, uh, stayed on side. The pass was from uh, Liverpool player Curtis Jones. Uh, slotted the ball past the goalkeeper. It was one of those like three or four second breaks from one end of the pitch to the other. Very cool finish. Um, but but that aspect of his game, I think, is one which doesn't quite get um, a great deal of attention. That ability to burst past players. We saw it in the Tottenham game when he set up the or was part of the counter attack for the the Aubameyang goal and just over 5 10 yards he has that little acceleration that a lot of our players don't um that ability to burst between the lines and and find some space in behind i think makes him not quite a unique player in this arsenal team but certainly one who's got qualities that that aren't easily replicated yeah i was quite surprised by his his turn of pace i totally agree with you i, I wasn't really it's not something I know we hadn't seen him an awful lot before, but it mm. wasn't something I was expecting. And, um, and like you say, it's, it's, if we, you know, a, a lot of what we do is quite sort of pinpoint counter attacking stuff. And we need that. We need that sort of, um, element of pace. And so I, I've definitely been quite surprised by that. I wonder whether that's something that's come with, with age, you know, a little bit, mm. um, a year into his career, maybe he's got a bit stronger and stuff. I don't know, but, um, uh, he's, um, he's definitely got a, a lot of things that, um, that you need, you know, that the kind of pace of the skill, the ability to find the right, the right space as well. He's um, and to th- it's a, re- a weird thought, isn't it, that only a couple of months ago, I know it was, I know it was kind of pie in the sky, but there was, you know, was it Villa? I think coming in for him on loan and stuff. Mm. And you think um, now, you look at it now, only a few months later, you think that absolutely no club in the world would let that talent go. He's, you know, he really makes a massive difference when he comes on. Yeah, I mean, Villa were trying to buy him, I think, because they knew they were selling Jack Grealish and wanted somebody like that. So I think they did make a couple of uh, fairly big offers. And then, of course, uh, was it, he did sign a new contract, I think. So, uh, you know, there was probably yeah, a little it, bit of that going on. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just funny that you wouldn't, you wouldn't really ex- expect nobody would bother making an offer right now, um, you know, because uh, he's not going anywhere. We wouldn't even countenance it. So... Um, I think those kind of improvement that we've seen in the last three months, or rather maybe it's just because we've seen more of him. Mm. You know, I think he's growing on us and on the team if, with, with every week. Uh, Bakayo Saka scored for England. Did you see that goal? I didn't yeah, see did. that goal. I didn't see that goal. Yeah, he's and, and actually... Um, oh, I did see it. Was it near post finish? It was a near yeah, post finish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was, yeah, he's... But the pair of them are absolutely... One of the things that makes this season has so far for me just been such a joy because um, you're seeing them grow. They're very young men, seeing them grow and taking this responsibility. And actually, you know, with all the kind of uh, baggage that Saka has had to kind of carry since the summer. And, um, you know, I know know some people think he looks a bit leggy and tired. I'm not so sure. (laughs) He's a a young bloke. He's probably got all the energy you need. It's, uh, and I think you play him. Like, what do you do? It's, it's, it's a bit of a dilemma. You don't want to burn him out, but at the same time, he's so crucial. To, to to what we do, um, he's one of the first names on the team sheet. So you know, I, I think it is one of those tricky things. But you would expect him to play more, you know, almost all of them. Yeah, I mean, he's it, such a good watch. I love watching him. He's such a he's such a he's such an exciting player. But also, you know, he's such a nice young man as well. And, he, and is everything about him just <laughs> is, is, is great. I love it. Does that then you know if something doesn't come off for him, you're just more willing to to let it slide. In other words, some player, if they misplace a pass, like, oh, for fuck's sake, what are you doing? But if yeah. Saka does it, oh, oh you, yeah. he didn't mean to do that. He meant to do something much better than that. I think he's got a, a lot of goodwill, hasn't he? Yeah. I, I, think, it would take, I think it would take an awful lot of of, um, of uh, sort of uh, Abue-esque mistakes to, um, 
to kind of for people to turn on him he's, he's he, the, the tank is of goodwill is full with Saka he's a phenomenal young player yeah for sure and look we make the point I think it's worth making the point that he's earned that goodwill you know through his performances and through his consistency and, and everything else so yeah look it, it is one of those difficult things for a manager when you have a player of that talent uh, and a player who really does seem to make a difference to your system as much as you might want to protect them. And I think the the, the logical part and maybe the protective part of us as, as football fans, which I think does tend to err on the side of caution a little bit when it comes to players that we like. Like nobody would have a problem, well, beyond the fact he was in the team week after week after week after week, but nobody would like worry if, you know, 19-year-old Mustafi was in the team week after week after week after week because you just don't care. But when a player mm. of a singular talent comes in, uh, you, you know, you want to be protective of them to a certain extent. But at the same time, the manager's job is like, well, I've got to win football matches. Yeah. I don't want to rest a guy who could perhaps make the difference, you know, score the first goal, make the second goal, like we saw uh, in the in the North London derby. Yeah, and it, it, I think, you know, if you look at the way that Man City have handled Phil Foden, who's mm. kind of, he's another player who's who's been talked up. Well, you know, and, and obviously he's a very good player. Um, I think they've had the luxury of bringing him in more slowly because they've got so many more better players than us. Mm. I don't think we've got that luxury. And, you know, the, the pressure's on Arteta to improve us from last year. I'm not saying we'll get top four. I think that's a tall order. But, you know, and, and um, you know, he I don't think he, he's... Why, why should he be, you know, be the one that just rests him um, more than he needs to? Or it's it's his job's you know, genuinely on the line if we if we come sort of eighth or ninth again. So you put your best players in um, until such time that you've got so many players that actually yeah. you can you can give them a bit of a break. But we we're, we're not you know we're not that kind of team. Well, yeah, I mean, it is funny to say that when we do have you know the club's record signing sitting on the bench behind him. If Saka plays on the right hand side, it is. Uh, to give him his full name, seventy-two million pound Nicholas Pepe, who's yeah. usually sitting out. So I do see what you're saying about that depth, but it is peculiar in this particular situation where, in that position, it it should be uh, something that we have. It's true, but like you know, if, if you're if you're putting your first eleven together um, at the moment, every time you'd put Saka in over Pepe, and that's not to say that Pepe has his strengths because you know he has that kind of maverick quality, but it's very inconsistent. Mm. Um, and so, and, and you know, you'd have him, you'd pick him, and that's that's what. So that's what Arteta's logic is, and it's completely sound to me. But what you don't want is what happened to poor old Jack Wilshire, who had his. What did he play? There's fifty something matches that season, and admittedly, mm. he used to fly in to tackles. He was, you know, pretty much a no holds barred kind of a guy. But um, and his career suffered because of those injuries and maybe being overplayed a bit. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a fine balancing act. But to me, right now, you don't drop, you, you don't, you don't rest Saka unless there's obvious reasons like he really tailing off his his um uh performances are tailing off but they don't they don't seem to have done so yeah um, that was one of the things i worried about a little bit was when you know as he started to grow in prominence that he would become a bit more of a target for certain players and i think that did happen to an extent last season where you know the way to stop him was to kick him or to foul him and I think that's in some ways what happened with with Jack that he was a bit more unfortunate he he took some kicks which really did have a a bad impact on him but uh yeah I, I don't know I mean I think um I would if I were the manager and I was picking the team it would be very very difficult to to leave him out so I do have sympathy with that one um I mean maybe we can get ourselves in a position where in in more games we're able to take him off we can give him a rest towards the end of the games. And this season, perhaps more than, hopefully, this will be the last time this is uh, happening. We we don't have a lot of midweek action. We don't have European action. So that rest between games, if you are asking a lot of him around these international breaks, you then have basically a week, um, you know, a week between, uh, uh, between games for him to recover more fully. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes a lot. You know, that does make a lot, uh, a lot of sense. And um, yeah, I mean, I I just think uh, <laughs> right right now he's he's undroppable, and as long as his his performance levels are high, you play mm. him. This is it. Really, is as simple as that for me. And uh, and if we can if he can help get us to where we need to be, then then you put him in the team. Um, but I love watching him. I really love watching him. And in a sort of same way that when I first started watching Arsenal, well, and you know 
in the in the eight, sort of mid eighties, late eighties, we had the brilliant academy guys coming through, mm. and there was a real excitement about them um, and just yeah, you know, what they could do as a kind of group of young men. And he's definitely in the same sort of vein for me. Mm. Patrick Vieira returns for the first time in his managerial career uh, on Monday night, which uh, adds a little bit of extra spice to this one. Certainly a uh, a legendary figure at the club in terms of what he achieved. We've got two former captains in the managerial dugouts, uh, which I can't remember if that's ever happened before. Um, certainly not in my knowledge. Uh, if it has, I'm sure the Arsenal history buffs are out there. But uh, it's an interesting one. I mean, what what have you made of his managerial career so far and his start to the season? We do have a, a Crystal Palace fan on after this who is uh, enamoured it has to be said with with Patrick Vieira. So, uh, have you been keeping tabs? You know, he's one of the he's one of those names that is mentioned whenever there there is a vacancy and whenever there will be a vacancy at Arsenal. I'm sure his name will come up again. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, he's another one who had who had a you know I think something to prove a little bit. His his you know he's he's been. Um, he, you know, I would say his his management his management career hasn't been a universal success as yet, but. Um, but I think, given I think Palace had an awful lot or have an awful lot of work to do um, after Hodgson left, and, and I think um, he's made a pretty good start. I mean, you know, obviously beating Spurs, uh, roundly beating Spurs, uh, endeared him to, to everybody. Battering them, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, but no, I know I really, I, I'm really looking forward to watching him grow and hopefully succeed. Maybe not on Monday. But um, definitely, he's another one. Monday. You know, he's another one who I think that the well of goodwill is so deep that he could probably Adibayor run up the pitch and sort of goad people and people would still sing his name. You know, he's, he's an absolute club legend. So, um, um, he will, I think it will be a bit of a Vieira fest at least. Yeah. A few songs, least, I think. And, and, at least until they score. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. I certainly can't see him doing that, <laughs> that kind of celebration, but I know the point you're making. It'll be very yeah. interesting to see, uh, you know, how he does at Palace, uh, this season. Before we go, uh, I should ask you, um, as it is the thing that keeps rumbling on the the Newcastle takeover uh, by the Saudi um, well the public investment fund who apparently is separate from uh, the Saudi state even though it's owned and run by uh, the Saudi mm-hmm. states um, is any of this a surprise to you does it alter the way you think about football the way you think about Arsenal even you know what what might be realistic for us in the years ahead I think, I think on the on a purely football level, it does worry me a bit because we are at a certain level, which you know is quite some way off where it needs to be, and we know that they'll be improving and buying, and you know it's already hard enough to break into the top four um, at the moment, and to have another contender, it makes it much harder for us. So from a from a purely footballing level, I mean, do you know what? In a way, it you know, I'm so part of me is kind of intrigued to watch it happen because it's always there's always an element of kind of um intrigue and excitement about someone throwing money at something but i think from an arsenal point of view it's um it's not particularly positive you know, it means we have to up our game more and 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 you know get to where we want before they get to where they want it does make it much harder um so yeah I, you know i'm sure it'll add to the um um the people watching the Premier League and a bit of intrigue. People want to watch Newcastle a bit more, but I don't think it's great news for us. What about the game in general? Is that too far gone at this point to express concerns about that? The way financial uh, interests have an impact on the way the game is being run. You know, all of the all of the things that people say. I mean, uh, Thibaut Courtois was talking about, you know, players needing rest, et cetera, et cetera. But there seems to be no um, acknowledgement of that from the people who who are in charge of the game because they're talking about World Cups every two years. And, and that feels like a bit of a power play to me, not simply from a financial perspective. You know, the World Cup is an amazing thing. Everybody loves the World Cup, et cetera, et cetera. But I think when it came down to like the quality of football, the actual pinnacle of the game, it was always, you know, what was happening in the Champions League, in the Premier League, maybe at the top of La Liga, 
you know, in Italy, in Germany, et cetera, et cetera, like the best football was being played domestically, it was no longer a case that the international game was the creme de la creme, which is kind of where it was when I was growing up. You know, that was the that was the thing which was seen as the very, very top level. And then over time, because of, you know, the way that players have been accumulated in, in various leagues and various countries, that changed. And it feels to me a bit like the, the World Cup every two years is a way to try try and um, not hobble domestic leagues or domestic football, but but try and put some more of that emphasis back on that. But but all yeah. of it plays into the financial side of things and the finance um, is what does the talking. It can um, pay off concerns that people might have. Is it a case that this is just the world that we live in now? Football is a reflection of society in general, if you like, because that seems to be what happens in the so-called real world too yeah i think it is a, a reflection of society to a degree but also i think it's a reflection of the regulatory framework of this country specifically if you look at the way they do it in germany it's you know there is a tons of money around don't get me wrong and i'm sure lots of uh, underhand practices but i don't think that you know that the way that the clubs are owned means you you know you don't get the um guys coming in with that kind of money you know make, making much you know and, and then once you've had it once and once you've let them in, then, you know, it does become a bit, does come a bit harder to, to, let, to, to kind of say no to some and yes to the others. I don't, I don't love it. I have to say, uh, and it probably, you know, the, the Euro guys running the European leagues love it even less because it's already hard enough to um, compete with the Premier League and it's going to be even harder with, with this kind of money floating around. So um yeah, it does leave a bit, a bit of a sour taste in your mouth, but I just think it's a reflection of where football is and where, you know, with loose regulation, then it was almost inevitable that this, you know, that, that all of our clubs, all the big clubs, would get mm. bit by bit would get picked off, mm. and that's what's happened. Very finally, um, did you watch the trailer for the Arsene Wenger film? I did. I did. Let's hope it's better than the book. Yes. But, um, <laughs> well, I didn't. I haven't even read the book. I, I, I kind of a few people that. Um, I saw a few reviews and a few people that um, mm, no, no, I asked me, thought, you know what? I don't need to do that. This is a shame. But the, but the documentary looks great. It does because uh, someone else is like making the story, if you like, you know, yeah. uh, experts, which is why I think I was really let down sounds a bit too fucking uh, self-entitled, you know, but uh, the book I was expecting and hoping for a lot more from the famed Arsene Wenger biography book that we never thought he was going to do. Like when he was manager, there was, you'd, you'd, you'd say things like, oh, when the autobiography comes out, we'll find out. But nobody really thought he would do it. And again, I didn't really expect a kind of kiss and tell, look at all the dark secrets, look at all the scandals and all that kind of stuff, because that's just not who he is we know that that's not the way he operated but i was expecting something a bit more substantive and uh, i think that the shame of it is that he didn't bring in um a ghost writer because there are very many talented writers around arsenal around football who would have done a fantastic job i think and given given it the kind of structure etc that it needed and that looks to be what's happening with this film the trailer looks great and mm. and um um you know, he can write, quite rightly dine, dine off the achievement of 2004. Uh, well, and the stuff before, but that, that those years uh, forever. Part of me wonders, you know, on a completely separate note, whether we dine out on it a little bit too much. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, we're starving. If we had more to yeah. eat, we wouldn't be dining out on that. As no, much. I totally agree. We look back more than we look forward, and that's fair enough, I suppose. But it was such a phenomenal achievement, and he was at his prime, you know, just an incredible manager, an incredible man as well. So um, I'm, not, I'm really looking forward to, to, to seeing that. Um, you know, and what he's doing at FIFA now is interesting as well because he's uh, certainly become a company man. Mm -hmm. He has a bit, which is a bit of a shame. But look, let's uh, let's park that there for now. I look forward to your uh, blogging exploits throughout the season, and uh, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a while, but um, always good fun. Thank you very much indeed to Jim. You can find him on Twitter at East Lower, at East Lower, and the blog, which has kind of come back to life a little bit in a sort of 
like you know the way the cat came back to life in Pet Cemetery, the Stephen King thing. It's a bit like that, but you can find it at eastlower.co.uk. Now, I told you earlier we have a, a game to give away. We have three games. Well, one game, but three copies of said game to give away. It is called Super Club, and it is a football manager board game for two to four players or two to five players with the official Arsenal expansion, which is what you get with this prize. It's like an early version of a digital football manager game, only here you're face-to-face -face with your opponents who could be your mates who are also Arsenal fans, but maybe some of you out there have friends who aren't Arsenal fans and this could be quite the rivalry indeed the game itself allows you to build your club over a period of time various seasons etc etc you can do stuff like invest in the stadium the training ground the scouting network staff members and you can improve your squad by scouting for hidden gems developing youngsters into superstars or signing players in bidding wars with your opponents around the table it's like the transfer market but in real life with people so close to you, you don't even need to tweet your bants at them. You can just turn around and say it right to their face. So the game is called Super Club. You can find out more at superclubgame.com. That is superclubgame.com. And to enter, it is very, very simple. All you have to do is send an email to competition at arsblog.com. Competition at arsblog.com. And just tell me this. What is the headline when you go to the Super Club Game website? All you got to do is click superclubgame.com, look at the headline, tell me that, put it in the email, competition at arsblog.com. I will pick three winners at random and announce them on next week's show. Okay, with me now on the Arsecast, ahead of Monday's game against Crystal Palace, the man who you could describe as the premium Palace podcaster from HLTCO, it is Dan. Hello there. Hi, how you doing? I am all right. There's only one place to start with this conversation because we are organizing it, you know, via some Twitter DMs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And one of the things you said was, I'm looking forward to it. I'm in love with <laughs> Vieira. So I, I think that's a sentiment that many Arsenal fans will will be able to reconcile with. And I know that when we spoke, you know, last season and the season before. You know, you had your, your issues with Roy Hodgson and the way things were going at Palace, et cetera, et cetera. But what specifically has made you fall in love with Patrick Vieira so quickly? Um, it's difficult to say one thing. I think the project itself, as much as I don't like the word project because it, it feels a bit sort of corporate, mm. was so big with the departure of Roy Hodgson, the turnover of players, the entire sort of job that was at hand and of course we had different managers that were linked with us uh, Lucien Favre uh, was one of the high profile names that was supposedly coming in and then Vieira had sort of arrived on the landscape and, and everyone was a little bit I wouldn't say let down but it felt a bit like after the Lord Mayor's show because yeah. he hasn't got the same sort of pedigree as someone like Lucien Favre does and the Premier League is an unforgiving division at the best of times but to be honest as soon as he turned up, he brought in coaches with him who've, who've integrated into the club extremely well. Uh, the transfer strategy has been fantastic. We've signed a number of, of young players, all of whom are extremely good technical footballers. And as much as you don't want to necessarily uh, put too much store by someone's playing career when they go into management, mm. players like Wilfred Zaha and Abir Eze and, and Michael Elise, they're all enraptured by Patrick Vieira. He's someone that has that, that presence amongst that group of players because they've grown up, a lot of them were Arsenal fans as far as I'm aware, when they were uh, in their formative years. And it's like they're going to work with a legend every day. And I think <laughs> that has enabled him to get his playing style and ideas across far easier than if he was someone who didn't have that playing pedigree. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very early days, obviously. And Palace, so far this season, have won just one game. And that was, of course, a very enjoyable 3-0 win over Tottenham, who I don't know if you're aware of this, but they get battered everywhere they go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> even at your place. So, you know, what a, what a big win that was. But... You know what? What's the what's the key difference in in the way that that Vieira wants Palace to play versus the way that Roy Hodgson had Palace playing down the years? I mean, 
it is really chalk and cheese. I think if if you look at Roy's entire way of approaching the football, it made sense for the squad that we had and the personnel we had in the sense that it was 10 men behind the ball. It was stoic. It was trying to soak up pressure and hit teams on the break with less possession. What Patrick Vieira has done has changed that completely to the point where we're looking to dictate possession a lot more. I think our average percentage for possession in every game this season has jumped about 10 points. I think it's either 49 or 51%. Uh, We're creating a lot more chances. The attacking players that we've got are getting on the ball a lot more. But to be honest, the, the key difference for me in terms of our ability to play this way is the fact that he's brought in Mark Gaye from Chelsea and Joachim Anderson, who was at Fulham mm. last year. Uh, and both of them are extremely good, comfortable, technical central defenders who can play long balls. They're quite pacey. They read the game well. And it's almost gone from our out ball under Roy Hodgson being a long ball to the flank for Wilfred Zaha to chase to our out ball being a ball back to the two centre-backs who can then you know reset and start us building again. So mm. the entire game plan is completely different. And from an aesthetic perspective, it's just it's been a joy to watch. I mean, it is different and clearly something big has happened because one of the things we spoke about last time, I think, was the the age profile of your squad and the amount of players who were 30, 30 plus players who were in the last year of their contracts who, you know, you you either had to renew or just let go for free. And you mentioned Gehi and Anderson who've come in 21, 25, 25, a very good age for a centre uh, center half. There's been some investment in uh, uh, Usan Edward, Michael Olise, 19 and 23 years of age. You brought in the young guy from Chelsea, central midfield player, Conor Gallagher, who's come in. So the age profile of the squad has really, really taken a big uh, hit is the wrong word, but you know what I mean? It's gone completely the other way. And there are some similarities, I think, uh, to what's going on at Arsenal in that respect, in that we too, you know, really invested in young players this summer. And is that, you know, do you get the sense that not only the, the arrival of a new manager with new staff to kind of come through with a uh, you know a clean broom or whatever you want to call it but but there is something there that they are trying to build on um, and trying to put in place uh, that is just significantly different it feels fresher it's it's easier maybe as a fan to get behind it even if it might take some time to come to fruition there's going to be some teething problems um you know with young players with a new project if you like etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you mentioned, we've only won once this season, but I think it's it's key to give context to those games because we've only lost twice. Both of those defeats were at Chelsea away and Liverpool away. Mm. Uh, we've had four draws. We came back from behind twice against West Ham away from home. Uh, we came from 2-0 down against Leicester most recently to get a 2-2 draw there and probably should have won it. It was one of those games where, you know, as much as we were in a 2-0 hole... It didn't really feel like we deserved to be in that. Uh, if you look at the Brighton game prior to that, we were 1-0 up in the 94th minute and unfortunately mm. for us, uh, let that slip with an error on our own part. So as much as, you know, from a neutral perspective, you can look at it and say one win out of seven is, is far from stellar form. The, the foundations and the building blocks that have been put in place in terms of our performances and how close we've been to getting results out of those games leads me and many others to assume that, you know, there are brighter times ahead. And, The entire thing with the change of squad, like you say, it was necessary for it to happen. But the quality of the players that we've brought in is is so great and they have such high ceilings that it almost feels as though this is the start of something that could really kick us on for the next three or four years, as long as obviously that nucleus of players stays put and the manager and coaching staff do too. Well, yeah, I mean, that's it, it is quite similar to what's happening at Arsenal. I know that, you know, perhaps the, the the expectations are different at both clubs, but you've got to, you know, when you're in a position like that, you've got to address those issues. Just coming back to Vieira, what has impressed you about, um, you know, the way he has settled into the job and the way he's interacted with fans, for example? Because I think... You know, a manager is judged very strongly on what they do and the results that they elicit from the squad and the teams that they have. But also, a manager can can build a connection with fans. He can, I don't want to say buy himself time, but he can... 
he can forge a connection with fans, which gives him a little more leeway to to experience some ups and downs, if you like, during the course of a season. So how has Vieira been when it comes to communicating his ideas to fans, what he wants to do with the team, what he wants to, to build at Palace? I think the main thing for me is that he came in and immediately it wasn't as though he was Patrick Vieira. He was very much someone that understood in terms of his Premier League management pedigree, this is not necessarily the first rung on the ladder because obviously he's been in charge at Nice and at New York City FC before. Mm. But he didn't come in with that air of... I mean, we had Frank de Boer, obviously, prior to Roy Hodgson. And it always felt as though, even though he was only with us for a couple of months, that he was doing us a favour. Uh, and this is the absolute opposite of that. He's very much bought into the entire ethos of the club in terms of how vocal we are at Selhurst Park. He talks regularly about how much of a difference it makes to the players having that support. Uh, In terms of youth um, development and putting people from the academy into the squad, he regularly has uh, at least two or three of the under-23 players with the first team. He gave uh, Jezerim Raksaki a debut at Chelsea away on the first day of the season. He's one of our most hotly tipped uh, young players. And then there's definitely a pathway there uh, with his coaching staff. I think he's put a a specific member of staff in place, Saeed Aigun, who previously worked at PSG, whose job is basically to oversee the pathway from the under-18s and the 23s into the first team. And that is a real sea change from Roy Hodgson because his entire approach was very much, you know, let's get the experienced pros in that I can Mm. trust that can execute the tactical game plan. And as much as there is an obvious game plan with Vieira, it's with an eye on the future as well. And he's shown that youth development is something he's very happy to look towards. And that is sort of Palace's USP, I think, when you ask our fans about how we view ourselves in the landscape of English football. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what do you think his approach is going to be for this game uh, against Arsenal? Because obviously it is a is a big moment for him to come back to the club where he was so successful as a manager of another Premier League club. Um, you know, you talked about the way that he wants Palace to play. Look, I saw a stat this morning which said that Arsenal have won just one of the last six Premier League meetings at Crystal Palace. It's drawn four and lost one. So these have been some fairly even games in recent years. Um, do you expect him to to sort of have a real go? Might there be a bit of caution about the way he approaches this game? I mean, this isn't, um, you know, the swashbuckling, all uh, attacking Arsenal of the past. It, it's a very much a very much a work in progress under Mikel Arteta. Um, so, you know, I don't imagine that there is going to be the same kind of fear slash deference that there might have been if he were facing, let's say, an Arsene Wenger team at its pump. Yeah, without a doubt. I think, I mean, I don't want to talk Arsenal down here, but I mean, you look at Chelsea away and Liverpool away, and I think on paper, every Arsenal fan would probably agree that in 2021, Arsenal aren't quite the same level of, uh, well, it's not as daunting to travel to the Emirates as it potentially has been in recent years. But I think the key thing all the way through this season so far has been that we haven't really altered our game that much. It's been a case of of sticking to our principles, trying to play the ball out from the back, get the ball to the feet of the uh, useful attacking players, whether you're looking at uh, Wilfred Zaha and Edouard or an Elise potentially if he gives him a start. And I think we will just continue along that path. There's a real resilience to the side as well, uh, which we would obviously need if we're going to be a bit more attacking in our approach than we were under Mm. Roy Hodgson. The fact that we've come from... Uh, 2-0 down against Leicester and we came back twice against West Ham sort of speaks uh, to that for me. So, I mean, I'm I'm not suggesting that we're going to get three points or even one, but I think that the way that we're going to approach the game is going to be dramatically different to the the recent meetings we've had with Arsenal and whether or not that that pays off is uh, still to be seen. But I think every single game so far, there has been something legitimate to take out as, as a plus point or a stepping stone to something greater. And I, I think this might well be uh, the fruition of that with, with three points away from home in a game that, you know, if, if you're a neutral looking at it, you wouldn't necess- necessarily expect Palace to get. 
Yeah, well, look, obviously, I'm not a neutral, and I hope you don't get them. Uh, <laughs> but it is. Go- I think it is going to be a really fascinating, uh, you know, a fascinating encounter between you know two former Arsenal captains as managers. Uh, you know, there are, there are doubts over Mikel Arteta, and I think people are looking on at what Patrick Vieira is doing at Crystal Palace and what he's going to do at Crystal Palace, and um, you know, not not to say that this is like an audition or anything like that for the Arsenal job. But, you know, given the way it ended for him in his previous job in France, um, you know, he had his experience in New York as well. You know, as as a guy who's trying to forge a career in management and as a club which I suppose is in the future going to go through managers, um, much more rapidly than we did when we had 22 years of Arsene Wenger. I mean, that's never going to happen again. So we're in that cycle of managers where, you know, three, four, five seasons, you're looking for you're looking for a new guy. You know, what, what's interesting about this from an Arsenal perspective is, you know, Vieira is one of those names that has been mentioned and linked with the Arsenal job in the past and, and looking at what he does with Palace might well inform how people view his his um, credentials, I guess. Yeah, I think without a doubt. I mean, the frustrating part for me, of course, is that, you know, even Palace fans, let alone Arsenal fans, when he was announced as, as Palace's new manager, were a little bit unsure. And now, you know, we're seven games in and, and the same people that were writing him off from a neutral perspective are now touting him to potentially take over at Arsenal at the end of this season if Mikel Arteta doesn't do uh, what he's expected to. Mm. Um, I think you, you would hope for a club like ours, you almost need to rely upon a manager that wants to put down lasting roots somewhere because it was why Roy Hodgson worked so well for us because of his age profile and everything else. It was never a case of him outperforming his expectations and looking towards Crystal Palace as a stepping stone. It was it was an obvious final job for him. And, you know, we've had situations in the past. Dougie Friedman was our manager and we were flying at the top of the table in the championship and he ended up taking a job at Bolton mid-season. So mm. there's always a bit of concern that we might get, you know, something really good rolling and then a bigger club comes along, takes the key part of it and we have to almost start all over again. But my hope is that, you know, Vieira doesn't view this as a, as a one-year thing and then wave goodbye. He'll want to, mm. in my mind at least, you know, if you're going to have long-term Premier League credentials as a manager, you pretty much need two to three years of consistent, solid work to sort of make sure your CV is, is bulletproof to an extent. And if he does, for example, we finish, say, 10th and then 7th in the next two years, then of course, you know, his stock would be incredibly higher. But I'm just not sure whether... A, Arsenal would benefit from him having a year at Palace and then taking that job as opposed to really establishing a style of play with Palace and and winning Plaudits from across the game because obviously the stature of Arsenal and the history he has with that football club would mean that he would be open to taking a job whatever point he was offered it as long as he felt it was the right move for him at that point. Yeah, I mean, look, that's the merry-go-round of football managers, but I know exactly where you're coming from as well, you know, from your perspective to to have somebody in situ who, if they are successful, if they do a good job, could, you know, lift the fortunes of the football club, um, you know, for for years to come. Um, Speaking of which, I mean, before we go, just a quick thought from you on on what's happened at, at Newcastle. Um, with the the Saudi takeover and everything else, you know, Newcastle were, I suppose, um, not analogous to Crystal Palace, but you sort of operated in the same areas of of the Premier League. And now it looks like uh, in the not too distant future, they are going to take a, a big jump forward because of the resources that they have, because of the the money that they're going to be able to throw at players and managers and transfers and, and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, we have our perspective on it as a club that has aspirations to be back in the top four, and it certainly makes things uh, more challenging or will make things more challenging as if they weren't already. Um, you know, how do you view it as... Um, a fan of a club who would have seen themselves parallel-ish to Newcastle in terms of what the expectations were for you in a Premier League season? I think, I mean, I can look at it in in two ways, really. Obviously, from a a direct competitor perspective, it's frustrating because that's another team that, as you say, would be expected to finish in the bottom half and and is now going to have ideas well above that. And it, it makes it a little bit more difficult than it was previously, uh, to keep your head above water. 
at the same time, you know, I, I've mentioned it a fair few times over the last week or so on my own podcast. I have quite a big soft spot for Newcastle's fans because I feel they're quite um, well-spirited in terms of, you know, getting through the 14 years with an owner in Mike Ashley they didn't want. Uh, and as much as you've got all of the issues about the, the ownership of that football club, I felt they came in for a fair bit of stick for celebrating it when actually, you know, they were just happy to be rid of Mike Ashley. And of course, a lot of water is set to pass under the bridge. We're not even two weeks into them having new ownership yet. But I mean, it it, it strikes me that it's more difficult than ever to sort of buy your way into success these days because of financial fair play, because of the size of the clubs that already occupy those top places it's going to it's going to take four to five years I would have thought before they can be regularly challenging for Champions League or titles um, and of course money is no guarantee of success it obviously is a massive help but I would imagine that there will be some serious conversations taking place across the Premier League to try and diminish the opportunity that Newcastle have to, to crash the party I mean I don't want to name drop here, but I, I spoke to Steve Parrish, the Crystal Palace owner, in an interview last Friday, and he mentioned his belief that there needs to be a hard salary cap in place in the Premier League if we're going to keep the idea of the Leicester Cities potentially going through and winning the Premier League one day, because without that, you're, you're going to be in a situation where it just becomes harder and harder. So, you know, as, as a Premier League owner and, and as one of the stakeholders in the division, I would imagine his opinion is one that is echoed by a fair few clubs and it's certainly going to be an interesting disruptor to the, the Premier League picture for the next five to ten years do you I mean talk of a salary cap and and what Steve Parrish said I haven't had a chance to listen to that interview yet and congratulations by the way on getting that because that's a that's a hell of an interview for Palace fans which is uh, available over on your Patreon but you know talk of a salary cap and talk of FFP I mean I think those are reasonable things to consider. And I think if football has any tiny little smidgen of competitiveness left in how it's run, and I'm not sure that it does, to be perfectly honest, those things feel like they should be inevitable. Some way of of equanimity or financial equalization, whatever it might be. So you can't have one or two or three clubs that just come in and dominate everything. I mean, it, it, to me, that's common sense. But it also feels very much like closing the stable door after the horse has bolted. I mean, do you think there's any realistic way that those sort of measures can be put in place? I mean, let's face it, 12 months ago, six months ago even, the Premier League were saying that the Saudi owners were not fit and proper owners and then all of a sudden this piracy issue gets solved that financial aspect to the objection from the premier league all of a sudden disappears their previous objections which were supposedly based on on other aspects are now a okay because that uh, that piracy thing has has been uh, has been sorted out so it's you know, while I see it and I want it and I would like for there to be measures like that in place, it doesn't seem realistic that they will be because the the teams with the money, the teams with the lawyers, as Man City showed when they were censured and, uh, you know, uh, given a two-year ban, they just have better lawyers and more resources and more money than UEFA. So how is the Premier League going to deal with owners like this? Yeah, I think, I mean, we all know that the... the objections to the Saudi ownership on anything other than financial grounds from the Premier League always felt a little bit far-fetched and it's been proven to be the case given the fact that this piracy issue has now been uh, sorted and the move has been uh, given the green light. He, Steve Parrish spoke to me about the... He, he said that they need real-time financial management in football because in his perspective... What happens at the moment is that a Berry will go under or another football club further down the footballing pyramid will go under and they get the, the black box out of the wreckage and they, they look through it and you know they, they try to learn from it after the event where in actual fact it needs to be a case of, well, you've got a budget for X and if you can't afford Y for the next three years, then it shouldn't be allowed through. But as you've already mentioned, the problem with that is that the clubs at the very top of the tree have so much more money than you know, the others below them. I think, I mean, I read during the Newcastle takeover sort of news cycle that they are now 15 to 20 times richer than Manchester City. Yeah. It's just, it's a ridiculous amount of money to even contemplate. 
Um, and obviously, from a transfer perspective and a budget perspective, FFP can limit that to an extent. But you, you mentioned the lawyers at Manchester City, and if the might of a, a country, or you know, let's not say that formally because they've been assured that there isn't this formal link between Saudi Arabia and their own public investment fund. But it's just, I don't know, you feel like you're fighting a losing battle. As a Crystal Palace fan, you sort of almost just have to look after your own situation in a way. Um, And, you know, to to a championship or a League One supporter, we're part of the problem anyway. I think that's the issue is that there's this, this huge us and them discussion that takes place now. And even if you are a fan of a Burnley or a Southampton or a Crystal Palace, if you're an Oldham Athletic fan or a Leighton Orient fan, you're looking at at Palace and thinking that we are part of the evil empire. So it's all shades of grey, really. And I think, unfortunately, it's just a bit of a race to the bottom, morality-wise. Yeah, well, look, uh, there's some big uh, and very fast runners in that particular race. So uh, let's see where we let's see where we end up. Listen, Dan, thanks a million as always. Best of luck for the season, but not necessarily for Monday. No, I wouldn't expect anything else. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Thank you very much. Dan is on Twitter at HLTCO, at HLTCO, and his Patreon is patreon.com forward slash HLTCO as well. He does general football podcasts as well as Crystal Palace stuff, so you might want to check it out. Patreon.com forward slash HLTCO. It is going to be very interesting to see how Patrick Vieira gets on in his uh, Premier League managerial career. I think we'd all like to see him do well, of course, not on Monday night, with all due respect to him, as much as I loved him as a player and a captain and an inspiration and a leader and somebody who contributed to some of the best football experiences of my life. I hope it all goes terribly wrong for him on Monday, but after that, he can beat the shit out of pretty much anyone else he feels like until the next time he plays us, and then, yeah, you know how it goes. So look, let's leave it there for this week. Uh, It's going to be a long weekend. We'll wait and see what everyone else does. We've got a game Monday night, so that means James and I won't be doing the Arsecast Extra on Monday. We will be doing it on Tuesday morning after the game, which, of course, makes sense. Lewis and I will have a Patreon preview View podcast for you as well. Make sure you're tuned into that. Patreon.com forward slash arsblog. Thanks as always for listening. Thanks for being here and your support and uh, sharing the podcast and comments and tweets and all of that kind of stuff. Thanks a million. Much appreciated as always. I'm sure you know, but it doesn't hurt to say it. Have a great weekend and we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye bye. down the left-hand side, squares it for Saka, Saka across, and there's Thomas Partey arriving now, and it's another goal for Thomas Partey. Remarkable, what a goal-scoring run he's on, having opened his account against Crystal Zimbabwe. He scored against Zimbabwe Wanderers, Zimbabwe Villa, Zimbabwe and Hove Albion, and now Zimbabwe Hotspur, who, if you didn't already know, get battered everywhere they go.